uh, our speaker Roy Anderson uh, and all the participants and the viewers welcome to the webinar series number nine organized by Kisol Society of Bangladesh. As the convener of the association, uh, I'd love to say a few words about our association before I start talking about this today's session. The Seoul Society of Bangladesh is an equal opportunity platform for the practitioners of English as a second or a foreign language in Bangladesh. The local chapter of the global TESOL community was first conceived on 18 December 2014. From then, the association has been working to build up a community of English language teachers in order to establish a more sustainable professional network across the country dedicated to the advancement of English language teaching in Bangladesh. The community has grown much bigger than expected. Now it has about 2,500 members on its electronic platforms. We are a community of English language teachers from all level of education who are trying to bring the Bangladeshi ELT professionals and the prospective practitioners of ELT under one roof by establishing a network that encourages diversity and respectful professional discussion among educators by organizing program with national and international collaboration. The association has a website, YouTube channel, Facebook page, and very active on every social media website in order to ensure the highest engagement and interaction among its members, the local and the global audience. A newsletter is also published to promote the local research and developmental works and the association's contribution to pedagogical area of the country on a regular interval. The Society of Bangladesh envisaged to nurture and flourish as an organization to help TESOL teachers, educators, policymakers, nationally from each level of primary to tertiary, while also being updated and compatible with other TESOL organization worldwide to contribute globally. Uh, during the pandemic, we have al already organized eight such webinars. This is our the ninth webinar uh, organized by our society. Uh, today's our speaker is Roy Anderson, who has dedicated his entire life to understand how children really learn how the school works. Uh, I really don't want to say uh, more details about Roy Anderson because we have our two interviewers today, Lija Sharmin, uh, Lija Sharmin and Afuja Tina from Daffodil In International University, who will conduct the entire interview and will also work as a moderator of the session. So I hand over to Lisa Sharmin and Afuja Tina. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much for the great introduction. Good evening, everyone. I once again welcome you all to today's session on Roy Anderson. And uh, as you have heard that both Ms. Lisa Sharmin and I would be conducting today's interview, uh, which is on the reason why school needs to change in the face of artificial intelligence. So this is our topic today on which Roy Anderson would shed light and uh, he would share his insights actually regarding the topic. But before entering into the formal session, I'd like to uh, mention one very important point that is, uh, well, as you are the motivation of today's program, so obviously we would uh, request you to put your questions in the comments section so that later we may collect the questions from there and uh, we may connect you directly with Roy Anderson. So please enjoy today's session. Now, before entering into the formal session, I'd like to start with a brief introduction about Roy Anderson, who is the principal of Kingston College, Lahore, and a recognized global expert in education. He's much appraised for his many years of scientific research into what intelligence is, how to improve the operation of the school, and how teachers can teach better. He has devoted all of his adult life to the better development of children. Roy is an expert in intelligence and is the inventor of the Brain Environment Complex Theory, which presents a new concept to what intelligence is and how children learn. 
He travels the world to explain why school fails today and why and how each school can raise the performance of its students, but more importantly, why we need to prepare our children with higher skills for the very different world they must live and work in. Our failing in this will deprive them of the higher language skills they will need to maintain democracy in a world dominated by artificial intelligence. Though his great experience in teaching, he has developed the Anderson attitude method of teaching, which is widely accepted as a simple but highly effective means for the normal teacher to dramatically improve the learning and grades of all of their students. His seven books are said by professors around the world to be some of the best books written about school, society, and learning. So we welcome Roy Anderson today's session. Uh, well, as you have just heard that today's topic title is the reason why school needs to change in the face of artificial intelligence. So I'm going to give you a brief idea about today's topic from uh, Roy's perspective. Well, the abstract says that this is a brief discussion on the way society and the school work together and the hidden 19th century agenda that still drives the operation of the school globally today. A new understanding to what intelligence is and how children really learn and how teachers can teach better. The problems faced by teachers in educating students prior to this pandemic, the online education they have been forced into <laughs> and how education will likely develop once normality is resumed. The danger of educationalists failing to realize the true design of education and how they can work better with parents to develop better lesson procedures so all children will understand their lessons better and be better prepared for a world that must be very different to ours as artificial intelligence increasingly takes control of our social design and work opportunity. So let us in short about today's topic. Now, Regarding this topic, well, I'd like to uh, start this session with my very first question uh, to Roy, which is, uh, well, obviously the basic question, Roy, what is this new understanding of artificial intelligence and uh, how you are actually associating this to the established idea of artificial intelligence? So this is my first question. Okay. Uh -huh. Okay, uh, let me screen. Let me share the screen with you to uh, answer that question. Okay, okay. Now, basically, what happens is that um, schools all around the world work in a 19th-century model. The purpose of this design is to produce the manager and the managed in a society. School does not teach children how to reason. It does not teach them how to think. They are processed on language skills, plus the drives they've individually got to want to be a doctor or whatever like that, minus the distractions they face, people bullying them, laughing at them, ridiculing them, in insecurity, fears, whatever it is. These skills we process them on, and many of these skills are socioeconomic, uh, which is something for later. Um, and basically, the children who perform better tend to come from better, uh, higher level families because they have a better language skill. These, these children go to university. The ones who don't go into university are not taught how to think and how to reason. The ones who go to university are taught high evaluators thinking skills for the more responsibilities they'll have as the manager in society and industry. So basically, School is producing two kinds of citizens. Uh, so the, the educational system is producing two kinds of citizens. The, the ones who are higher reasoning and the mass who are less reasoning. And obviously there's a big reason behind this. But we still use this design without understanding it. And the problem we've got now is that that design worked very well in the industrial era. It became less so in the technological the technological and the computer era, and now we're moving into the world of nanotechnology, it's going to produce very serious problems for our children. So let me explain to you 
basically what I'm talking about here. We hear that within the next 30 years, 50% of jobs will be taken over by artificial intelligence. And many people are saying, well, you know, we'll think of new jobs. So we'll, in the future, we'll, we'll find new jobs for people. So everybody will have a purpose and a function. The people who say that do not understand what nanotechnology is. I'll explain to you in a moment. But first of all, let me explain to you. If I say to you, uh, what is the purpose of a job? You'll say to me, well, I, I, with a job, I can earn some money and I can buy some furniture, rent a house, have a holiday, buy some clothes, whatever it is. And then you come home. And by doing that, you have a sense of identity, a sense of social responsibility. You know who you are and whether, you, whether or not you're happy, you, ha you have a purpose in life. Now, if you lose your job after six months, you don't have that social identity. You don't believe in yourself. And if you don't believe in yourself, then you don't believe in your society. Now, every country carries five, eight, nine percent unemployed people. But these people are so diversified, we don't understand the effect of them. Once artificial intelligence begins to take over the workplace, more than it is now, we are facing huge amounts of people with no work, no self-belief, and no belief in the society. And that's the problem. So let me just explain to you a little bit more about that with some slideshows. You see, civilization is held together by societies producing and sharing trade. And so we have people who go and collect the natural resources. They take the iron ore and they make it into steel. They take the oil and we, we make it into plastics and gases and things like that. And people are employed in these factories, production lines, distribution, sales and administration. People have a job. So in a society, depending upon its level of technology, about 80% of people obtain their job through the mass movement of molecules. What we're doing here is that we are taking the a molecular structure, we, we, we're, we're heating it by, by temperature to, to make it. So we, we take iron ore, we melt it, we make steel. We take oil, we heat it, we make gases and plastics. This is the mass movement of molecular structures. We're just heating and coding, heating, cooling, heating, cooling, bending, welding, whatever it is. Now the problem we've got now is that the world that we're moving into will not work on those parameters anymore. As I've just meant to you, the next 30 years, 50% of jobs are to be taken over by artificial intelligence. But we need to understand the difference between artificial intelligence, which is kind of like computers, as to what nanotechnology could be. I hear a lot of people talking about the fourth industrial revolution. This is wrong. It was one industrial revolution from 1750 to 1950. Then we had the technological revolution and we had the computer revolution. And now we're moving into the nano era. Let me explain to you the reality of, the, of nanotechnology. The idea of nanotechnology is that you have a machine that's so small, they're nano size, you can't see them, you know, they're very, very small. And there are two kinds of these machines. There's a dissembler and an assembler. Now, the, the dissembler can drill into any substance, rock, soil, oil, clay, mud, whatever it is, and by its computer program, analyze the molecular structure and dissemble that into individual atoms. An assembler will then follow, and, the, and this will assemble these atoms according to its computer program to make a new compound. So that one machine is making another machine, another machine, these are self-replicating. Now, the idea then, is that these machines then link together according to a computer program to create whatever the program designs. So it could create a book, it could create a glass, it could create the chair or the walls or the roof, the ceiling, the computer, anything the computer is designed, is programmed for it to create. Now, by a, pro by a system called machine phase system, these machines can then come apart and make something else. So theoretically, the machines uh, making this glass could then make this, and so on and so forth. 
Now, there are proto-models about this already in existence, so this is not science fiction. Let me go back to the screen here. <clears throat> <clears throat> Okay. Oops, now, 50 years ago, 50 years ago, which is a long time, NASA had the idea that if we could send just one of these machines to the moon for the program, then by the computer program, it could create a whole space establishment with no human being involved with it. And that was 50 years ago. So we need to stop thinking about microchips to begin to understand what nanomachines are and what they're capable of doing. Now, at the same time, of course, in 2015, which is now five years ago, and that's a long time ago, Google pronounced a success in producing a machine that's capable of holding a normal conversation with a human being. The machine is capable of displaying emotion, which is anger and aggressive thinking, and is temporal and stated. Artificial intelligence just got threatening. So we have to move away from the idea that we are controlling the computers to a realization that the computers are beginning to be able to interface and to some extent control our social and our work. Now we are driven by the idea of the work of the citizen. We are the conditioned citizen. You know, in school we teach children mathematics, we teach them history and geography and sciences and things like that. We don't teach them how to understand money. We don't teach children the worth of money. So when they leave school, they get a job, and with the little money they've earned, they want to buy something. They don't have enough money for it, so they borrow the money. So they go to the bank or whatever and say, please lend me some money so I can buy this. From that moment onwards, they're in debt. And throughout the whole working life, they're usually in debt. And debt is the mechanism by which sort of civilization works. Because in order to pay your debt, you have to go to work. You can't say, oh, I don't want to give, I don't want, I, I give up, I don't like this job, whatever, because you are in debt. So you have to go to work, you have to be responsible when you work, and the whole mechanism works on this factor of debt. Basically, because we're not teaching children how to be prepared for this work scenario when they get into it. So what we need to do here is to, just let me go back to the screen. Um, Uh, are we, are we, are we, are we, are we back on the screen now. Can, can you see this yellow uh, yes. symbol on the screen? Okay, okay. Yes. This is the standard distribution or the bell curve, whatever it happens to be. Now you can see the average people, we are conditioned. We recognize celebrated people, the success people, you know, the millionaires, the billionaires, the movie stars, and we think that one day, if we work hard enough, we can kind of move towards a celebrated it's, we have the We have the failures, the, the people who didn't succeed, the, the drug addicts, the people without jobs, the people in the street, these are the people we're frightened of. So we're conditioned to understand that we have to go to work. Now, bear in mind now, we have a mindset that I go to work, I get my money, I'm responsible, and I can look after my family. But what's going to happen when the machines really begin to take over the work, the work that we can do? Well, um, you have here, we call it the standard distribution. Basically, it's a graph that's supposed to show intelligence, the range of intelligence. But if you, do, if you, do, if you, if you understand that in every society, everybody's mixed together, and so we're learning and sharing thoughts and helping each other, whatever. If for any reason we became diversified, so that, for, for example, you've got people from, let's say, America and people from the Amazon jungle, totally different lives, totally different experiences, different education, they will have different values of intelligence. So, we, so if we move into an era where, I'm just going to go back here now. This is my fear. If we begin to move into a world where there are not sufficient jobs to support the mass of the people, then there will be people who obtain jobs by serving the society, for example, doing healthcare work, psychology, and these kind of people. And they will be required by the system. So they will be given opportunities to work, 
they will be given incentives for their children to go to my school and have a good education, good opportunities, and et cetera, like that. But the people who now have a job, who will not have a job, or their role will not exist in the future, teachers, <laughs> whatever, they'll have no fault, they'll have no income. They, they might be supported by the state to some extent, but the point is they'll have no drive to want to be responsible for themselves. So the world in which they live will deteriorate. Drug abuse, criminality, crime, morality will go down. You know, as the crime goes up, drug goes up, morality comes down. And because intelligence is not genetically inherited, it means that the children who live in the smaller environment where they, where their parents have a better opportunity, they will get an increase in intelligence. But the children living in a decaying environment, drug abuse, you know, uh, drugs, abuse, crime, wherever, their intelligence will go down. So over generations, it will appear that one element of people are genetically higher than another element of people. And it's not true because intelligence isn't genetic. I can explain a bit more about that later. But the problem is then, if I go back to the screen, we all want to be safe. That's, that's, that's what we do. We, we love our families and we worry about them. We want to be safe. How then do you protect your family if, you're, if there are so many people who want what you've got? And so then we're going to kind of look at this situation here. Whoops, sorry. So, I mean, it, it, we have a situation here where there's some people who, for whatever reason, are frightened of another people. And so they put these people in a huge uh, containment. And the people within this containment are not allowed to leave. It's very difficult for them to get out. Their children, their grandchildren, their great great grandchildren, or whatever, will be trapped within this compound. And my problem, my fear is that while this is, is happening in one country, it's also developing in South America. And with the development of technology, if, we, if, we, if, if our populations produce two classes of citizens, those who are required by the society and those who are not required by the society, then those who are required by the society will create and demand um, uh, physical and electronic structures to protect themselves. And once, once that happens, then we are facing anarchy on a big mess. And the problem then is that, well, of course, at the same time, you know, global warming is a reality. Thank, you know, thanks to Allah, this... Uh, pandemic has warned some people about the reality of pollution but of course once it gets going again we'll forget all about it and the ice fields will start to melt etc so in the next 60 or 70 years it's predicted london and new york and of course calcutta whatever will be underwater now this doesn't mean that people are going to get you know wet feet or whatever it means that our civilization is going to place Massive amounts of uncoordinated, uncoordinated movement of people. People moving away from the coastal regions and people moving down from the highlands because the glasses have melted, there's no drinking water. And so we're facing a lot of people coming together. A lot of people just coming together. You, you can imagine the room you're in now. Maybe you could say, well, I can have 20 people in the room. Well, we can survive. But if 200, 2,000 people want to come, you've got to lock the door. You say, no, you can't come in here. So then what's going to happen in the future if so many people have no jobs, no security, and they want security, and at the same time they're moving away from areas that are now not safe for them because of the effects of global warming, then at some time in the future we're going to cause mass anarchy. And I go back to this here. Um, okay. And if we, and I'm sure it's going to happen. I mean, it's already happening now for different reasons in Europe. You know, we've got a mass of immigrants coming in and there's so much collapse of designated society. The problem then is how can we maintain security? And the disturbing reality is that it's going to come from artificial intelligence. Now, what I'm going to show you now is not science fiction, it's a reality. Um, and we have to understand now the problem of how do we control masses of people who have no regard 
for the safety of others. It's quite frightening. Just watch this. It has cameras and sensors, just like your phone, and social media apps. It does facial recognition. Inside here is three grams of shaped explosive. This is how it works. We have an opportunity to prevent the future you just saw, but the window to act is closing. So, you see, basically what, what I'm saying here is that we live our lives, we think about the problems we've got, you know, uh, can I buy this, can I afford this, how is my auntie, you know, blah, blah, blah. We live our lives. We try to be happy. We watch the television for entertainment. We don't understand how quickly the world is moving. You're, you know... Until you realize what it was like 115 years ago, we couldn't fly. You know, we just couldn't get off the ground. Now, of course, we're flying to the, to, on our way to Mars. Technology is changing so fast. And we've got to try to predict the social effects of the technology that we've got now. Now, when I began my work, as we'll explain later, it was just to help children have a better chance. I failed school and I didn't want children to do the same. But once I understood how the school mechanism works, then I realized that we are still raising children on a 19th century ideology to be the manager or the manage. And we need to change them. We need to teach children how to reason and how to think so that they will have, hopefully, a greater chance of controlling their own lives and working towards helping each other with sympathy and compassion rather than by insecurity and fear. Because if we fail in that, you've just seen an indication of the world they might live in. And it's horrific. And this is what I've been dedicated my work to, and why I try to meet as many people as yourself to talk about this. Okay. Well, that's part one. Okay. Thank you, Tina. Okay. Thank you, Roy. Hello. So let me ask the next question to you, Roy. Okay. I'd like to uh, focus on brain, as you have worked on human brain. How how is brain uh, play? Human brain plays a wonderful role in learning. Mm -hmm. Actually, my question to you that as a teacher. How can we engage our students' brain in learning process? You know, that's a very, very important question, Liz. You know, what happens is you imagine you're a teacher or a parent, whatever, and you see the child doing something. They've got a pen and they're doing like that. And if they understand it, you think, well, he's smart or oh, she's smart. And if they don't understand it, you think, well, look, I'll try to help you. And they still can't understand it. And you think, wow, they're born differently. You know, I mean, I've got this child who understands and this one who doesn't. Uh, and it's not my fault because I'm teaching the same way. Therefore, there's some difference, some difference that I can't control. Therefore, it must be inherited. Uh, to, be, to, get, to explain this, I, I want to explain that um, when I was a student in school as a child, I didn't understand. I was, got, I was marked as average in everything I did, you know, five out of 10, six out of 10. It made no difference for me. I was bullied, I was insecure. I just tried to be happy. I thought if I can make the teacher happy, they'll like me and therefore I'll get a better grade. It never worked. And when I was 17, I went for the final examinations in school and I failed every single one. Every examination they put before, I failed. Just a, well, actually, they got a U, which meant I classified. Just you, 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 you. Just a complete zero. With the 12 years of his education, I was illiterate. I did different things, and I went back to school when I was 20, or to college when I was 20. And for two reasons, my whole life changed. I'd been in the army, and that taught me to fight for what was important for me, to, to stand up and, and to, 
argue or, or, or not to give up. And secondly, and the most important is that I wanted to sail around the world. I wanted to meet other people and other cultures and other countries. And I couldn't afford that. The only way I could do that was to get a job on a ship. To get a job on a ship, I needed my qualifications. So that was my drive. And with those two factors of not giving up and fighting for the information and having a purpose to continue to drive. So I was phenomenal success. I was the top student in the first year. And then when I left after three years, I had distinctions that were extremely, extreme. And it was a big question for me. How could I be so intelligent when I was 24 and so stupid when I was 17? So then in my 30s, I decided that I wanted to help children in school. And I, I began to try to reason how school works. And I studied genetics, neurology, and all these things. And I wrote six, six books. The most important one, really, was this book, The Hidden Secrets of Intelligence Revealed. You see, when I, went, when I was 30, I, I would go to the schools and I would say to the teachers, why, why aren't these children all understanding? Why, why are some you know, really understanding one or two? And why is the rest kind of lost and confused? And the teachers will say to me, well, you know, Roy, they come from different backgrounds, but they're born differently. And I thought to myself, well, you know, when I was 24, they said I had a very high gene count. When I was 17, they said I had a very low gene count. So I didn't believe that. And I thought, maybe we're not right. Maybe we are not born with intelligence. And so I spent over 10 years understanding the political mechanism that drives society through psychology. And so I went back over 300 years to find lies, fraud, disinformation by senior psychologists, whatever, to convince civilization that intelligence is inherited for political purposes. Well, that's another aspect. But you see, once you understand that intelligence is not inherited, then you become to question what makes difference in, in children? Why do some understand better than others? And to do that, we, first of all, we need to understand that it's not the brain that's actually doing the work. It's the mind and the heart. Now, the heart itself is 40,000 neurons. In it. It's not just there to pump the blood. So what's happening is two-way traffic between the mind and the heart sending information. Now, in a class, the human child, the mind of the human child is searching for interest and security. So if the teacher is boring or the information is not presented in an exciting way, the mind is going to drift. Oh, that's more interesting, that's more interesting. And if the individual feels a sense of insecurity, and remember the classroom is a very competitive environment, even for adults, you know, <laughs> it doesn't change. And, and students will use Machiavellian schemes to make other students fail. They'll laugh at them, they'll bully them, they'll, they'll try to ridicule them. So the student will feel, oh, I'm no good, they don't like me. And once that happens, they're not concentrating. And if you don't concentrate, they don't grasp the rule. Now, then we need to understand that school has got nothing to do with intelligence. Any normally born child, child who doesn't suffer from a genetic mutation like Down syndrome or oxygen starvation, whatever, can learn the rules of school. And if they work at them, they can get very, very high marks. So um, to understand the way school works, we then need to understand that it works on a factors of language. And, and school works on two kinds of languages. One is mathematics, and the other is English, French, Urdu, Japanese, Russian, whatever it happens to be. And these languages work on rules. Now, there are three factors behind the child's ability to understand these rules. One is the home background. And this is a huge subject. But basically, if the parent is able to raise their child with a sense of self-discipline, a sense of security, know who they are, to be proud of who they are, to give them the confidence to inquire and to engage information, a sense of orientation, if the child then in the school environment is supported by their peers and not ridiculed, laughed at or hurt, which many are, and if the teacher can inspire the, the students to want to learn and make the information readily accessible to their experiences, 
that every child would get top marks. The reality is that many children come from broken homes, problems at home. So that when you're in the school classroom, the mind's drifting about this. In the classroom, they are hurt by others laughing at them because the the clothes are the wrong color or whatever it is like that. And you know, why doesn't he like me? Uh, I, you know, oh, she's a nice girl, whatever it happens to be. So they're not concentrating on the rule. And if the teacher doesn't understand the importance of the relationship between the mind and the heart, then they're just giving information. You know, okay, everybody sit down, listen to me, I'm going to blah, 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 blah. And have you all looked at the server and say, yes, sir, but they didn't understand anything. So you have to present information in such a way that the student is fascinated to want to, to listen to it and then have the confidence to interrupt it. Now, let me show you exactly what I mean about that. If I can just go here. So, uh, can I just summarize uh, the prescribed yeah. teaching procedure uh, by saying teaching before reaching before teaching? Actually, are you talking reaching to the students before teaching? Oh, okay, I, I haven't heard of that one before. Yes, yes, you could say that. Um, uh, you have to reach. You know, I, I have a saying that to open the mind of a child or a student, you must first open their heart. And it means that you have to give them a sense of security and interest before you begin to give them information. Now, this is a, a, you know, this is a, a big thing we can talk about. But it basically, it means that you do not walk into the classroom and you don't say to the students, sit down, be quiet, open your textbooks. You have to create an atmosphere where they respect you where they want to meet you. The teacher who thinks that authority is the way to control the minds doesn't understand how, if, they're, excuse, if, the, if the student feels f frightful of the teacher, they can't concentrate, they can't focus because they're frightened. And therefore they're not, you know, it basically it's, it's like this. Um, you develop your, your senses, your, your eyes, you know, to, to see and to hear according to how fascinated you are and how not distracted you are. So if the information, if you're not distracted, and if the information is very interesting, then you take this very, very precisely into the memory networks. Now, the student who's had a comfortable, engaging learning environment, they will have developed very precise information. This information will be put very clearly into boxes in the memory. So the new information that comes in links immediately. They recognize it. They know what it means. But most students, as I just explained, they're so distracted. So this information coming in is vaguely assorted in their memory networks. So when the new information comes in, they can't find out how to connect it. And they don't have the confidence to do that. We need, to, well, this is a big thing, but we need to, to develop confidence in our students so that they can respectfully argue and inquire. It's only when you actually talk with somebody else in depth, they're, they're actually, you know, it's not information that's coming in. You're actually changing the neurons and the dendrites within the brain. So, you know, if the, if the dendrites in the brain, the brain is like that, to get new information, they have to change for that to happen. Okay, this is a huge subject, but basically, the way that you see information, or the way that you develop it, is who you are. You, you have an identity with yourself. Everybody says to you, you know, Roy, this is wrong. You're doing it the wrong way. But if Roy believes it's the right way, or even if he thinks it's the wrong way, but just by doing that wrong way, he's understanding who he is, and therefore he has his identity. So if you're going to change information, if you're going to teach, the first thing you've got to do is to create a solidarity, a trust and a relationship with the learner, with the student, so that they want to change. This means that they have to love you or, or you know, respect you, whatever it happens to be. If they're frightened of you, they can go of their identity to take your identity, which disturbs them. I, I remember, you know, you know, I've been in uh, Nepal, in India, in Kathmandu, and, uh, sorry, in, uh, in Pakistan. And a lot of teachers, people think, wow, England is such a great, you know, and it's such fantastic education over there. It isn't. It's terrible. 
it, you know, uh, education is the teacher in the classroom. It is not the country. Um, and and I remember two years, three years ago, a mother explaining to that that in a good school in England. A maths teacher had shouted at her daughter in the class, in front of everybody, and said, you are too stupid to be in my class. Now, that destroyed the child's belief in herself. So she couldn't, she couldn't think. Uh, and I, I'll explain to you in a moment. Remind, remind me to talk about cortisol. But basically, she couldn't think. So she lost interest. Her grades fell down because that teacher shouted at her. And there's so many instances about it. So if you're going to teach, you've got to understand the importance of love. You've got to understand the importance of creating a common respect and a trust with the person. Because in order for, those, for, in order for that brain to change, that person has to want to believe in you, that you are nice and you are kind. Otherwise, they're keeping to themselves and the brain isn't changing. So part of the teaching process is to cause is to create a relationship. I, I, I call it a comradeship in learning, where the teacher and the students learn together. It's not the teacher giving information. It's the, it's the teacher actually pretending that they don't know very much to give the students the confidence to believe they can know it and they can inquire and, and engage with it. And then you're really helping them to learn. Um, so, uh, so if we are talking about the brain, forget the brain. As I, as I explained to you, the brain grows with experiences. Um, in fact, the cerebral cortex, the, the, the top, the cauliflower at the top, that, that develops just through experiences, which brings another important point, is that the children today who are spending so much time with, on digital you know, uh, instruments, you know, uh, computer games and um, smartphone addiction, their brain is de physically developing in a different way to our brain. And that will cause them so many more difficulties to relate to the social world that we understand today. I mean, that's evident with children now. Um, but we can go on and on. So please ask me a question for another direction. Yes, Roy. Thank you so much. Now, uh, as we have uh, mentioned that uh, well, there was fear, even there is fear actually. And uh, maybe there's lack of preparation, you know, lack of understanding of this artificial intelligence, lack of mindset as well. And uh, you have also talked about the robots and the, the technological advancements. So, well, uh, what is your idea actually? I mean, is this artificial intelligence going to take control? Uh, I mean, is it going to control our mind? or uh, I mean, social contribution, then what we, what would be the opportunities actually for us? So what's your point of view actually regarding this? Um, let me simplify my answer. Um, look at the normal citizen in the society. They're not taught how to think in school, they're taught to pass examinations, depending upon how well that they're passing to get a job. When they go home, they put the television on for entertainment. The game shows that they watch. They don't think the answers. They're just watching other people thinking. And they think that they're enjoying it. When they watch a comedy, they're told when to laugh. Because, they, they, you know, there's a background, ha, 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 and then they laugh because of it. So they, they are, their mind is being entertained by this uh, program and it, it is designed to keep the citizen passive and happy that's what it is we are just programmed and the danger now is that as this uh, technology is developing more so it will influence more the ways that we think and the ways that we can think uh, and um, it's very frightening the way it can go so and i say to you the only way that we can kind of delay the process or even try to prevent it to some extent is by causing the children to think, to get them to think more about what they're doing and how they're doing it. And that's twofold. You know, we teach the children to use the word what. So they don't understand, they say, Miss, what is this? Sir, what do I do? Now, when they do that, we are, we are conditioning them to, be, to, accept, to accept authority. 
So the teacher will say, you do this, okay, I'll do that. Or I don't want to do that, but I'll do it because I've been told to do it. And that's the 19th century design, whereby the citizen is then kind of um, compliant with authority. Even if they don't agree with it, they'll comply with it. And that's essentially so that everybody would then be happy. Um, uh, Will, uh, if, I, if I interrupt you, Roy, yeah. will the same idea actually has been shared by some of the audiences mm -hmm. uh, who are actually enjoying the session? Some of the uh, people actually have shared the same idea that uh, they actually in school uh, found this problem that most of the people are more concerned about the grades, but not about their learning. Mm -hmm. And everyone was asking about grades, which grades actually did you receive? and uh, I mean, which class actually have you been promoted to? I mean, something like this. So yes, this has been a problem actually in our educational system as well. So that was my point actually, what uh, as educationalists or as uh, peer academicians, what's your suggestion? I mean, how to cope up with this situation? Well, okay, then we have to understand the purpose of school. The original purpose of school was, you know, <laughs> The child lives in a three-dimensional world, run, laughter, play, cry, eat, whatever it is. The purpose of school was to teach children rules by which they would conform to a work ethic. They would go to work at a time, they would behave in work, and they would do what they were told. That was the reason why school originally came about. And then as it was realized that as our technology developed, so the, the future worker had to be more competent so we introduced reading, writing, you know, a world about history and some, you know, physics and sciences and things like that, which are, which are completely useless. You know, most children will never use the science or the chemistry, whatever they, they learned in school. It's just to get grades. So the purpose of school is to produce the next worker citizen. That's what it's there for. And that means that when you come out of school, the piece of paper that you've got will give you the job in the future. So if you've got good marks, you can get a, a good job. If you've got lesser marks, you get a lesser job. And therefore, the grades are embedded within the purpose of school. You can't get away from it um, because, the, because the working world needs to know the quality of the worker. And school does that. Well, it tries to do it. Um, what we need to do is to learn to teach the children, okay, be, because we don't understand how the children learn, we are just thinking about the grades. There's a lot of pressure on teachers to get the best grades that they can for their children. So what they do is they teach them to memorize information and they teach them exam strategies, which of course is soulless, it's boring. There's no excitement for the children. They just got to learn to remember this and then they've got to do this, you know, put it together to pass an exam. There's no life, there's no purpose, there's no meaning. So what we've got to do is to teach them to understand how to think so that they'll think by themselves to get this grade. You know, um, teachers actually don't teach children how to learn. Um, you learn by yourself. The smart kids, the ones who are, you know, the, the big scorers, the intelligent kids, they taught themselves. It was their drive to, to find out how something worked that enabled them to be the better student. The problem is, okay, I want to go back to something that uh, Liz was talking about before when I talked about languages. I, I, I didn't actually finish that, and I'd like to do that because it's really important to understand this. Um, so just allow me just to go back to that, So, and then I'll come back to, Tina, what you're talking about. Okay. <clears throat> so, uh, okay. So here we go. Okay. Okay. Now, can you see this maths equation here? Yeah. Yes. Hello. Yes. Okay. So it's it's a very simple equation: six divided by two, two plus one. Now we're going to look at two students here. Now remember, you remember I told you before. That if you, if when the teacher's talking, if you listen to the rule, if you're focused on the rule, you understand it, and then if you work with it, you get a competence and you know how to use it. It's as simple as that. And school is just rules. It's rule, rule, rule. Everything in school is rules. 
sit down, sit up straight, pick the pellet with your right hand, hold it here, move this way, that way, whatever. And everything is rules. And if the child is emotionally happy and calm and interested, they will learn those rules and they'll practice it and then they'll become great students. As I said to you, most kids are distracted and bored. They don't hear the rule, they don't understand it, they're confused and they don't know how to think. Let me explain exactly what I mean now here. <clears throat> <clears throat> So we have a no. In order, so we have two students. In one student, one 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 student, this student, this young man here. When this teacher was um, explaining the rule, he wasn't listening. His mind had drifted. He was thinking about, oh, you know, um, I'm going to play a game tonight. Or that was a nice movie, or this is a boring lesson, or you know, his mind had drifted. So he didn't hear what the teacher was saying. He he heard the first part that to solve the problem, you must do the division. So he said, great, okay, I, I can solve it. So he uses logic. And he says, well, two plus one is three, and then two times three is six, and then six divided by six is one. Now it's complete logic. He's totally wrong, but for him, he doesn't understand why, because it's logic. Now we have the student who listened to the rule. And the rule is, in this case, of course, is bond mass. Now, bod mass means that when you're solving this kind of a problem, the first thing you do is the brackets, and then you move from left to right. So in knowing the rule, first of all, this young man, he does the brackets. So two plus one is three. Then he does the division. Six divided by two is three. And then he multiplies three by three to nine. And he gets the top marks. This has got nothing at all to do with intelligence. It's just understanding the rules. Now, if you, so, if you learn the rule, if you understand the rule, if you practice it, you become proficient with it. Then you've got the, the tools to know how to think. So when the teacher gives you a learning exercise, you can negotiate through it. Oh, I know what to do. I know, this is fun. I'm happy. Yeah, this is good. I know what to do. I can think. That's great. Then you're inspired. You believe in yourself. You know, in the West, we spend such huge amounts of money on creating creative classrooms. Get the kids to be creative. So we, we have designer desks, you know, beautiful colored rooms, whatever like that. Huge amounts of money. It makes no difference at all to the student's learning. Creativity doesn't come from the environment you're in. It comes from you believing that you're good and doing something that you think is fun and that you believe you can do. It. That's where creative comes through. So if you learn the rule and you know how to think then you're inspired, and then you make applications of that rule into other areas, and then you're creative. That's where creative comes from. However, if you didn't know the rule, then you don't know how to think. And you see, you're stuck there, and you put your hand up and you say, uh, Sir, uh, help me. The teacher comes along, they don't have time to help you. There's 40, 50 kids in the class. They, oh, yeah, blah, 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 blah. Do you understand? Uh, yes, no. And the teacher's gone. <laughs> okay. And then you look around, you see other people doing it, and you think, oh, they can do, and I can't, therefore they're better than me, therefore I'm no good, therefore I hate this subject, and I want to go home. That's the problem. If they, if they learned the rule, if the teacher could teach them that rule, they would believe in themselves, they'd know how to think by themselves. So it comes down to language. Now, let's go back to the screen here, and I'll show you the problem that we've got. Mm. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so where do we go? Um, whoops, it is. Uh, okay. So can you see this uh, lady and the two children? Yes. Yes. Okay. So this is an example of a teacher teaching some children. It can be anything, you know, really Pythagoras. Well, this is just an example. So the teacher is teaching the children how to write the letter to A. She's given her a perfect example, and she said to the children, please do this. She feels very secure, she loves the teacher, and she wants to be like the teacher. So she does the A the best way she can. 
Now, of course, he doesn't have the same you know, dexterity, but Harry is very good. Now, the boy's happy, but he wants to go and play football. So his mind is thinking, oh, I'll do the A. Now, who, who's, going to be, who's going to be in my team? I'll do the A. Where is the ball? I'll do the A. Uh, what time is the bell coming? Because we want to go and play. So his mind is shifting. So his mind is going, you know, A, football, A, football, A, football. And because of that, he puts less concentration and less effort into what he's doing. So that means, that means that at the end of the lesson, the teacher is great, the bell's gone, everybody has done the A the way. I'll collect all these differences that they've all made by their effort, and we go to the next lesson, which will be the B or continental drift, whatever it happens to be. Now, the problem is that for the boy, his A was, was caused by, his poor A was caused by lack of concentration. But next lesson, next week, next year, it'll be his ability. And because we believe that students inherit an ability, we accept the differences that children have got. Now, so look, look at this example here. This was written for me by a girl who'd been in school for eight years. Now, there's nothing wrong in her story here. It's very factual. But look at the presentation. For eight years, eight teachers have said, well, it's okay. This is your way of doing it. This is your way of doing it. I tried to help you, but you don't listen to me, so it's your way. And they mark her. And she's been marked, you know, five out of ten, six out of ten. Like this. Um, and I, and I, I said to her, I, I want to show you how to write beautifully. So I wanted to shoot, teach her. I showed her some calligraphy, you know, beautiful handwriting. And I showed her how to do an A, and then how to do a B. And she said to me, that's so beautiful. Now, when she said to me, beautiful, I knew that she was having her purpose, to want to put her effort to make it beautiful. And so I helped her, you know, five minutes here, ten minutes there. And remember, for eight years and eight teachers, this is her product. Two weeks later, she wrote that. Two weeks later. And now the difference is now she gets top marks. And now she believes in herself. And it's basically how we teach us what they become. Now the, this, this, there's so many offshoots to what we're talking about here. But you see, once they, get, once they get top marks, they believe in themselves. And then they're on the top. Then their ego drives. Oh, I, I don't want to come down. I've got to put more effort in to be the top. So they're propelling themselves to go work harder. At the same time, they're concentrating better, so the information is going in meter and connecting meter, and they're understanding better. And it's just basically that's what it is. So the purpose of the teacher is really to get the children to concentrate on what they're doing. And that means not, you know, make it fun and exciting and interesting so they're not thinking about the football or, or the games or whatever it is. So they're concentrating on what they're doing and the second part of the teacher is to help the children who didn't understand or misunderstood the rules of the previous lesson, the previous years. Because when you had a class of kids, I mean, look at, look at grade one, you know, or the play group, the kindergarten, whatever it is. You've got some children sitting down, you'll have some children who'll be listening to the teacher, and other children will be running around because their minds on different things. And if the teacher is not able at the first level to get everybody listening to what's happening, understanding the rules and practicing and developing them, then some who will go to the next year will, will, will have fragmented understanding. So they won't know. So the teacher is then trying to teach information at the same time, repair what they didn't understand in the previous year. And it's multiplied as the years go by. So what basically, how, I don't know if I've got the graph on here. Um, no, but anyway, uh, so it's not, it's not that we have smart kids and average kids and a few stupid kids. It's that every child is intelligent, but some children put more effort in for whatever reason, so they understood what was happening. So when the teacher asked a question, they immediately saw the note and said, I know the answer. And they did. But most children, because they were bored and distracted, they're confused. And so the mass of the children in the class, they, when you ask them a question, they're struggling to find the answer, but they don't have the confidence to fight for it because we don't raise them to have the confidence to do that. 
We're, we're ready to just sit down and take information. But the only way you can change those brain patterns, those, those neurons and dendrites, is by actually respectfully arguing. Because you've got to believe that the other person is better than you. Otherwise, nothing's going to change. And of course, then you get you know, the troublemakers, the kids who don't understand or don't put the effort in or whatever, because they don't believe in themselves. And that comes down because they didn't bend the rule. Therefore, they see other children doing what they think they can't do, and they didn't put the effort into it. But then this is, so this comes to how can we actually change it? Well, Let me yes. give you an example. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Thank you. There are so many questions yes. from the audience in my inbox. Oh, okay. uh, let me okay. just ask one okay, question ma from, from there. Yeah. Uh, one of our colleagues okay. wants to know that as a teacher, she wants to survive in this AI-oriented, AI-dominated world. So what should she integrate with her teaching pedagogy to be a successful teacher in this AI-oriented or dominated world? How can she be a successful teacher? How she be equipped? Um, you know, for me, the best teacher is the teacher who has no technology and sits on the floor with the children sitting around them, where they are answer question, answer question, where they're talking. The problem we've got is that we tend to think that because we've got computers and programs, that we have to get the children to learn how to use a computer so they can learn the information by themselves. The problem is, is that if you say to a child, okay, here's an assignment, go to the computer, go to Google, whatever, and, and make your write your assignment. So the kid goes to the computer, they type in, um, what is this? And answer them, boom, they take that immediately. <laughs> they might even use it. And they put it down on a piece of paper, and they give it to the teacher, and she says, oh, this is very good, great, and give them a mark. The problem is we're not teaching the children to be, uh, to analyze the value of the information, which comes back to the reason. We're not teaching them to analyze the quantity, the quality of the information they're getting from Google. They get one answer. We don't teach them to search for other answers to see how they compare. The answer that comes up might not be the best answer or might be the wrong answer, but because it's the most popular one, that's the one that people go for. So although we are moving into an artificial world, we don't need that to teach children. In fact, we are... We, we, are, we are failing our children when we teach them to use this technology because, because you need to learn to the human experience. You know, in America, they have these virtual classrooms where the children stay at home and, and they, the information comes on a computer screen and they do these you know, software programs, whatever. 60% of them fail because they're not putting the interest in it. It's only when the mother is sitting next to them that they're actually engaged and, and thinking about what they're doing. But you know, but computers, screens, and software, they're just pressing the button, pressing a button, seeing what happens. There's no drive, there's no desire. Where am I going? Why am I doing this? What's the meaning of it for me? You know, so th the best way to be a teacher is to understand yes, we are moving into a higher technological world, but we don't need this. Because we don't need to teach the children how to type, because now there are computers where you don't type, you just speak, and the computer writes it for you. I mean, you know, we, we are not using the technology as we, as we could do. Um, so uh, um, we, we're talking now about, for the teacher, it is to develop within the children, not technological skills, but a belief in themselves as a human being, and then acquiring confidence to say, I don't think this is right. I want to challenge what you're saying, Miss or, or Sir. That's what we can do. Now, when I told you before, when I said the word what, you know, what is this? So we are causing them to be dependent. That is the plan. That's the idea. That the citizen society to conform to what the managers, you know, the better trained would, would tell them what to do. So everything works happening. But, but now, you know, we have this two-tier. We have the manager and we have the managed. 
But this this well, this topic is now being replaced by artificial intelligence. So it's artificial intelligence and the human sphere interacting. And therefore, it's very important that we now develop within our children two ways, how and why. How is this happening? Why is this happening? You know, we, we, we talk a lot about teaching critical thinking in school. It doesn't have any effect at all. The kids get a question, what would happen if Napoleon Bonaparte were left or if he were right? Um, and we call that critical thinking. So the kid does the answer and they've forgotten that. Nothing's changed in here. The way that we interact or relate to the outside world hasn't changed. To, to, to make that change, we have to get them to use these words how and why so often that it's changing their brain structure. Now, as I told you before, the cerebral cortex, the top part, that is with the, with the word what. What is this? But the emotional how and why takes place in the limbic system, which is underneath. So if we if we use this word how and why more, then this part, the, this part of the brain would expand and would grow more, and therefore it would be stronger and you would use it more. But it only comes with the confidence. So that means that the teacher has to change totally in the way that they interact with children or with students. But it's not, I, I want to show you exactly what I mean now. So the idea of the rows of desks and the teacher saying, okay, I'm the instructor, here's the information, learn it. It's not happening. Because th this information is coming in, the board, the strategy, they can't connect with, they don't understand, they're confused. You have to create an, a learning environment where the teacher is engaged equally with the children. Or even actually pretend to be a little bit more stupid so the children believe that they can do it. Let me show you a little bit of what I'm talking about. This is important. <clears throat> Yes, Roy, if I interrupt you, if I interrupt you, because we have actually people from India, Nepal, and obviously from Bangladesh. And uh, so we have a lot of audiences with us today and people are enjoying the session. And uh, we also actually are receiving questions uh, through the comment section. Now, uh, one of the uh, persons, uh, Wee Chi actually, has been trying to connect since the beginning and uh, he has been mentioning several uh, points. And uh, he also asked uh, several questions. Uh, for example, his, one of his questions is about how to protect actually ourselves from the machines that you talked about in your slides, you know, that uh, machines with artificial intelligence are about the technological advancement. So how to save ourselves actually from those uh, machines to be get a better life actually in future. And in relation to this, he also has mentioned that how can we control actually the mind of the learners who already have that kind of traditional perspective, I mean, regarding, oh, I mean, this intelligence. So how to control their minds as educationalists or uh, true academicians? So would you like to mention uh, uh, specifically anything about these two points? Um. Uh, the, the, the reality is that we can't control this technology. It is developing. It's being fueled by people who want to make a lot of money uh, and making, who, who, don't, who don't have a, a soul value. If to them, they live in a world of money. They make the money, they use the technology, and they make more money. They don't care about the social, moral effects of this. And we are stuck within it. And the more, the more, I mean, look, you know what happens? I mean, uh, this gentleman who's raised the question, my friend, do you use Facebook? Do you use LinkedIn? And, and therefore, you're already, in, you're already engaged within it. You're, you're attracted with it. You know, when I first went into Facebook, I was spending like three hours every day. I thought, oh, my God, what a waste of time. It's, it's, it's using our life. It's using our name. We, we, the, the answer is that we really can't as a mass control of this technology, it is taking over and it will continue to take over. The only thing that we can do is to try to help our children to be aware of what's happening. Unfortunately, so many parents think, I'll give my child a smartphone and they'll learn because they're doing this and they're happy and they're developing their thinking. Oh, they're, they're smart because they're very clever. Oh, my children, very good with games. The reality is they're developing no cognitive development 
all they're doing is they're just responding to light, responding to sounds. They're just following. They're not thinking about what's happening. There's nothing mechanical changing within the brain. The problem is that they're losing language. And this is the big problem. You see, once you get addicted to this, you're not interested in other people. Somebody says, you know, somebody says, uh, Roy, I've got a problem. I say, well, that's your problem. I'm playing my game. It's more fun for me. So then you're, you're, you're failing for this social cooperation. But then when I've got a problem, I then don't have the experience to explain my thoughts, my feelings, because I've lived inside this. So then I get frustrated and I get short-tempered and whatever. And anyway, this gives out non-thermal, this gives out non-thermal radiation, which certainly with children does disturb, disturb their brain chemistry and their brain patterns. Um, so um, it's not that we can control this artificial intelligence, but we can certainly help our children to be more aware of it by controlling the time they have on this. This is killing our civilization. We're losing language skills because of this. And of course, you know, language skills is not just vocabulary, it's sensitivity and awareness, being able to define a world with high language meanings and relate to other people more sensitively. And if you don't have that, then you become more brutal in your language and so in your mannerism. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I remember I was in Turkey and one man came up to me and he was crying. You know, the tears were really coming down his face. And he said, Roy, I can't stop my son playing computer games. He plays six hours, seven hours every day and I can't stop him. The problem is that we are losing our children. You go into any house now in the world and you'll see the son doing this, the sister doing this, the father doing this, the mother doing this. They're not talking. They're not interacting. They, they, they don't, they've lost that. And if you take this away from the boy and say, go and play, the boy doesn't know how to play, but the parent doesn't know how to put the effort in because he's forgotten how to do it. So uh, I try to keep on track because there's so many things we can talk about. But basically, we have to take this out of the lives of our children. And it's a problem. What I suggest is that if the child is younger than eight years old, take it away. Say it's broken and you'll get a new battery. And they'll cry, they'll hate you, they'll throw things at you, and they'll go into a rage for two days because this child is no longer your child. His mind is, or her, their mind is being controlled by a machine. But then after a time when they've calmed down, then you to put the effort in to create a learning environment with them, hands on, build things, go and dig a hole, whatever it is, you know, make dresses with the girls, whatever it happens to be. You have to give your time. Now, if they're older than eight, well, course, then you have to use psychology. Yes. And then yes, you can Lord. say. Uh, got your point, actually. Uh, I have a curiosity. Uh, may I ask you a question regarding tertiary level of education? Uh, how will you compare teaching? Uh, uh, in one of your speeches, uh, you shared your Japanese experience, your, your experience in Japan, actually, teaching tertiary level of students. Would you please share something else? Uh, well, we, we beyond primary and secondary level. We've got to answer that guy's question. I, I'm sorry. Um, there's, uh, I was going to ask this about mind learning. Um, but... Okay, so I'm sorry, what, what was your question about Japan? What was your question? That means I'd like to know about tertiary level of education, which is beyond primary and secondary. Tertiary, okay. teaching tertiary level of students. In Japan? In Japan? In Japan. You shared, yes. Perhaps you shared in, in your... Uh, okay, well. Well, just, okay. Uh, um, <clears throat> how can we differentiate primary level of teaching with tertiary level of teaching. I don't understand your question. The, the line is, is not coming through. I don't understand exactly what you're saying to me. Can no, you give me an example? Uh, I would like to know. Yes, primary school teaching with university teaching. How can I'm, we differentiate teaching at school with teaching at university level? Okay. Okay, okay. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Well, the idea of school is just to give information, just to give information. That's explained. I know I understand what you're talking about. Okay. 
the idea of school, as I explained to you, is just to give information and to evaluate this children's response and grade them. That's the idea. And you, mm -hmm. you're supposed to evaluate them on what you think is their intelligence. So the, so the intelligent kids get the higher grade, therefore they get the chance to go to university. The ones who aren't so clever, they go to college, they go to work, whatever it is. So the purpose of school is for the teacher to give information and then yeah. for, to, de to decide who will go to university and who will not go to university. The ones who go to university, they are then taught in a different way of thinking. They are then given work examples that, innate, that cause them to think about what they're doing. And they are then guided on a, on a, on a kind of a one-to-one uh, -one dialogue or in a group where they are caused to analyze so much more information that they're pressurized yes. to deal with yes. it. Therefore, mm -hmm. they're then forced to be able to evaluate it better. Um, yes. you, you can understand that the child in, in ninth, tenth grade, they are forced with information, but they're forced to memorize it. In university, they're taught to analyze it because the purpose of university is to create the more responsible managers in society. Um, but I wanted to get back to this question that the gentleman asked about control of mind, mind learning. Tina, what, what was that? What was the question again? It was... Tina. Uh, yeah, yes. sorry. The question from that gentleman uh, was, was something about mind learning. What, what was his question? Yes. Uh, well, his question was how we can protect actually ourselves yeah. from the machines. Uh, I mean, from those yeah. advanced machines, which uh, are trying to actually take our positions. Okay. And the second... Well, so... Uh, Yes, and if is if, I mean, if it's possible to live without these machines, who are actually threatening our future in some ways or the other, so that was his concern <laughs> okay. actually. Okay. Well, um, if you want to, if you want television, if you want lightning, if you want to have house lightning, you can't. You've got to give up the television and go and live in a remote farm somewhere. <laughs> Otherwise, you can't escape from it. Um, but th there was another question about mind learning. Something, something about mind learning. Anyway, um, just let me, how to build confidence in students. Okay, Rakshan is asking yes. how to build confidence in students. Um, okay, so let's know, we have to understand that when a child comes to school, we don't give them confidence. We take it away from them. We tell them that you must do this, do as I tell you, and learn this, and learn this, and learn this. And then when they're about 13 years old, we say, well, why don't, want, why don't you want to learn it? Confidence comes when you believe in something and you believe in yourself. Now, I, when I teach, I, I teach, you know, even very, very small children, I teach them to be responsible for themselves to what they're doing. This is your life, it's up to you. But of course I help. You know? So if you can give the, if you can raise school children, to be more responsible for their own actions, then they will be more responsible. The, the worst thing I see is a teacher teaching 16-year-olds the way they teach 10-year-olds. A 16-year-old wants to be grown up. They don't want to be taught as a child. Um, so to give children more confidence, it really comes back to the rules. So first of all, uh, okay, to have more confidence in a group, you have to believe in yourself. You have to believe mm. that you're not threatened, that nobody's going to hurt you or laugh at you. That's number one. So the teacher must make sure that there is no, no nastiness, that it, this is a happy, happy school where each child has been taught to respect the rights of every other child. That's number one. Absolutely no bullying, zero. We can talk about that another time. Then if the child believes in themselves, They've then got to believe that they've got the confidence to, to respectfully argue with the teacher. So the problem is that if we are just teaching children to learn, look, I'm the teacher, learn this, learn this, learn this. But they don't have the confidence to say, well, miss, I think you're wrong. Or sir, maybe <laughs> yes. it the way. And that's the kind of mind we need to do. And to do that, we have to really change the way that we're teaching. Let me show you. Let me show you. this. <clears throat> Okay. 
So you can see the, you can see this. Well, we have, we have several other questions. So if you can make it short so okay. that everyone okay. gets the chance okay. actually to receive an answer from you. OK, OK. Now, this actually is the most important thing. We have rows of desks. Now, the purpose of the rows of desks is to create disparity so that some children will learn better and other children will learn worse. The children at the back, they can't hear, they can't see as well. They don't have the chemical relationship as the children in the front. So the first thing we have to do is to understand that the classroom is a political arrangement. Now, look at this. Now, this is me in the pool. Now, the desks are fixed. I couldn't change the desk. They, they, they were made in the design of the school. So I am forced to be the instructor. Okay, here I am. Here is the information. Blah, 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 blah. Learn it. Now, at the end of the lesson, I then collect the books, take them to the staff room and mark them and give them back the next day. But look what really happens. I went into a staff room and there was 40 books that a teacher had marked. And in every book, there was about 30 lines. The teacher just marked me. Okay, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. You know, uh, very good, see me or whatever. It's okay, it's okay. Now, there's five lines here in this example, five lines out of 30 lines. And in those five lines, the teacher had ignored six errors. So the, the teacher had not taught the child how to develop by those six errors in five lines. And remember, there's 30 lines. So you multiply, you know, by whatever number. Now, the problem is that the teacher doesn't have time. If he spent two days going all these books and gave the books the back the next lesson, the kids aren't interested, it's finished. It's a waste of time. The only way you can change this is to catch them at the moment they're making that mistake. So if we move from this and this to this, then the whole ball game changes. Because now the teacher has a one-to-one -one with every single student. They have that eye contact. And you've got the eye contact, you can understand whether or not the student is understanding you. And then you know that if they don't understand you, you have to change your strategy and how you're teaching information. So, so yes, Roy, will this this point has been already mentioned, you know, by some of the participants uh, through the comment section. We, I can see that uh, some of the participants mentioned about mentioned empathy, building rapport, you know, to develop confidence, to I mean, uh, inspire the learners. So, uh, one of my colleagues, Deepti Rahman from Daffodil International University, she also asked a question like this i mean how to inspire our students especially uh, we are talking when we talk about tertiary level students so i think you have already answered that question and uh, will uh, my last question from the comments section will be uh, from mamutari kulhak he has been asking the question uh, two times the same question he uh, wanted to ask i mean this uh, i mean about the traditional kind of education that we usually have the competitive ed education uh, which we have in our society actually, which exists here. And uh, he asked this question, how this can actually instill moral, social, and human values among learners? Or uh, are you seeing a conflict actu actually between these new perspectives of artificial intelligence and uh, the earlier one? I mean, it's my question also along with Tarikul Ha. So that would be my last question. Uh, yeah, okay. let, me, let, let me simplify the questions, which was very important. <laughs> I think, um, in our part of the world, the assessment system, the traditional assessment system that focus more on, you know, the summative assessment. So you are just talking about the role of, or the impact of assessment <coughs> on, on, on the, uh, the skill that you are talking about. So uh, when we are talking about all these issues, I, I guess uh, the assessment system it itself is an important factor that we, live, we need to look into. How do we evaluate our learners at the school or uh, at the university level? Mm -hmm. And do we need to transform the assessment system as well? We're going to be here days. This is a big topic. Um, well, just to simplify it. Um, uh, well, okay. This, uh, if, we, if we're going to assess 
students, we must also assess ourselves as a teacher. Because if we can teach better, if we can get the children to learn those rules better by the way that we teach, then we are actually helping them in an understanding. And one thing I do want to share with you here before we lose the signal again, is a system that I've developed, which is so really important. And, and if, if nothing else happens, I just want to explain this system to you. When I was in Japan, I was working in medical university. In the first year, I had 60 students. This next one was about 80. And the third year, I had 130. I was so good. Everybody wanted to come to me. And there were so many students in the class, I couldn't move. I thought, wow, well, how am I going to teach them? You know, there's too many. I so I thought, I've got to get a way that they can help, they can learn by themselves. So I devised a system. I got them all into the corridor or outside, you know, whatever, into two rows. So you've got row A and row B. And everybody's facing each other. So everybody's got a partner. And then, okay, then the idea is that the partner in, from row A asks the partner in row B a question. Okay. Now then, then after a certain time, if you do it, if you keep it too long, they'll dry up. So to keep it going, you make a signal like that. And then when they hear that, then the person at the end of row B moves right to the other end and everybody moves up one space. So then the partners have changed. This is very, very a good way to help them to learn. Three ways. And I use it with professors as well as kids. Everybody loves it. Uh, my, my friend, the next time you're doing a, a seminar or something, get the professors stand up, put them into rows, and I promise you, they will love it. It's a human interaction. So you use it three ways. Number one, <laughs> before you begin a lecture or a lesson in the classroom, whatever, the students come in. Now, most of those will have given no thought to what's going to happen in the lesson. They just walk in, sit down, and wait for you to switch them on. <laughs> Maybe one student said, I said, what did I do last lesson or the lesson before that? So their mind is already getting ready. They don't do that. They just come in, sit down and wait for you to give the information. So when they come in and they settle down, get them to stand up in these two rows and they ask each other questions about what they did in the last lesson or the lesson before. Then you're getting the mind working, ready for the new information you're going to put on top of it. So then... If they didn't understand something the previous lesson, they've got a chance to understand it. Now, just a few minutes, like five minutes, something like that. That is very, very important. And then when you're going through the lesson or the lecture, whatever it happens to be, if you feel that they're getting lost or bored or whatever, get them to stand up and put those two words. And I promise you, I promise you, magic will happen. They will be happy. They will be engaged. You, I mean, you have to make sure they're not talking about the movies or whatever. But if they're talking about the lesson content, then they will help each other to keep up with what they didn't understand. This transference of information. And at the end of the lesson, the lecture, whatever, well, I, I actually, you can use the two rows, but I use a, a quiz where I put them into group, groups and I ask them less uh, questions from, sorry, I ask them questions from the lesson to, to present the information in a different perspective so they see it better. And it's this idea of keeping the information alive, happy, and interesting that keeps them going on. And you can, and that, those two rows system, I, I really beg that everybody listening tries it because it is such a really great system. And as I said, you can use it with small children, and I use it with, you know, scientists and professors, whatever. As a human being, they love this chance of talking with each other. Um, okay, um, so. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm forgetting the questions I'm being asked, I'm short-term memory. Can you ask me another question, brother? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Um, there, was a quest there was a question, or what, the best way to evaluate the learners. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the best way, and the honest way, is to, is to create a time frame where you can sit down with each student individually and ask them questions and recognize how they respond with that information. Then you're understanding exactly what they, how, they, how well they know that information. If you have a large class, so it becomes difficult. So then either you put them into groups and watch how they behave in a group, or you, can, or you, or you have to resort to you know, write an assignment and, and 
and then you mark it by the questions that you ask them. But the best way to evaluate uh, an ability or, or, or a knowledge is on a one-to-one -one dialogue. Now, Denmark do that. Uh, the final examination is the Danish system. The students take a written and a verbal examination. Unfortunately, they don't teach the children how to verbalize. So, that, so some children will be naturally more confident to, uh, to present their mind and others won't be. But if they taught the kids how to have the confidence to verbalize, then it would be better for them. Um, but uh, the best way to evaluate what another person knows is by questions. This brings us to another point. You know, every book about psychology will tell you that the first IQ test was devised by Alfred Binet in France in 1905. It's wrong. Binet never made an IQ test, or that Binet and Seaman did, or that they did. It's a great one-to-one -one verbal discussion to try to find out if a child had a learning problem because they came from, you know, uh, uh, problems at home or a learning or socioeconomic problems or if they had an organic problem. That's all they did. It was the Americans, Goddard and Tierman, who changed that, corrupted that into a political uh, IQ assessment. Um, but okay, so, so the basic answer is one-to-one uh, -one verbal discussion. Then you understand exactly what, how well the student can put together. But remember this, is that every student in the class understands that information. But many of them will not have the confidence to put it together in the way that they think it should be done. So it's not that they don't know the information, it's that they don't know how to put it together in the way that they think that you want that you that you want to hear it. So it's a question of how you develop it. If I understand uh, in Jackson, um, when you're talking about socialization or you're talking about discussion, right? One of the yeah. challenges that we, we face in our traditional way of grading and selecting items in case of assessment, we quantify students' performance, right? In case we would love to change the uh, way we want to evaluate our students. So uh, how do we quantify the student performance in a method that you are advocating. You know, most of the grading are quantifying students' learning outcome. I'm talking about the uh, traditional way of assessing students. So what should be the alternative to this traditional way of assessment? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay, so that comes back to what I said before. The purpose of school is to Evaluate who will be the professional class, who will be the engineers, who will be the cleaners. That's the purpose of school. And it uses a system to understand how much the student is doing. So if the student has got this information and can present it this way, they go this way or they go this way. That's what school is. Okay. Our job is to find out how well the student really understood it. Is that we can't do it in mass. We have to be able to find some way that we can talk more, more individually. And that means we have a responsibility of this region. You know, there's a very good system developed in the 1980s called flipped classroom or flipped learning. Flipped learning. Now, what normally happens in the learning environment is the teacher will say, okay, next week we're going to do calculus. I can't remember. That's it. But with flipped learning, the teacher says to the students, okay, next week, uh, we are going to do continental drift, whatever it happens. I want you to prepare yourself for this lesson. So here, here, I want you to look at these resources, I want you to read these pages, and I've made for you a simple, simple video that explains what continental drift is about. Then, and then this is a, uh, this is a, a social uh, platform where you can talk to each other and help each other to prepare for the lesson. Now this is great because you're giving the responsibility for the student to do their own learning. This means that they're not just sitting there, blah, 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 blah. And they're really, oh, this is great. This is my responsibility. I can learn by this myself. So then the, the students, they learn this information. And then when they come to the lesson, but then you give them the kind of questions and tests to find out who actually put the effort into them. Then you can give them a project. 
And when you see them doing this project, they're really happy because it's they're learning, it's fun, exciting. And the ones who didn't understand or who didn't learn, well, then you have time. You have five minutes, ten minutes. You know, each child because because all of us are working on the project. So flip learning is really a very very good system. But you know, to uh, um, uh, I, I think that rather than just giving information and at the end of see a season or a term or a year, a year evaluating, we really have to be evaluating them every lesson. And the way to do it is, is to have some kind of a um, some kind of a, a dialogue where you're where you're talking with the children, and you can do it with that classroom I've designed I've got there. I, you know, I want to show you this because this is a um, uh, this is so interesting. Uh, okay, this, this design changes everything. You know, if you can go from this, this, into this kind of a plan, then the teacher is able to have one-to-one -one conversation with every student. You know, I mean, you have to make compromises, of course. But this way, the teacher can help the child to understand what they don't understand when they're doing it. Now, you know, when I was in Kashmir, it's very, very crowded. I mean, I 50, 60 kids. But in, in about 90% of classes, we could still arrange the desk in such a way that the teacher can have one-to-one -one communication with the student. And if you can do that, then you can help you can teach them, you know, our country. You can explain why. And then the people and not the person. One lesson. So lesson by lesson, week by week, year by year, but you know, within one year, you've got a substantial development. And you're moving away there from just giving information to the child being able to understand what's happening. And then and then by that interaction, you're you're getting an awareness of who's understanding individually. So throughout the whole year, you know who can learn by themselves and who doesn't put the effort in or who's struggling. And then you do the formal essay, okay? You know, sit down, you get 60 minutes, write this essay, and I'll mark it. But that's really how they can present it. This is another thing, you know? We have to teach them language skills. Now, I didn't have time really to go into this, but when I gave the example of the mathematics equation of 6 divided by 2, what I was explaining to you, if you learn the rules of mathematics, if you learn the rules of how to transfer those numbers, then you're good in math. But also you're good in physics and chemistry, which is formulas and equations. So your mind knows how to work, it knows how to think. Therefore your ego says, oh, this is great fun, give me more, I'm happy. But if you don't know those rules, and you see other people doing it, you think, oh, I'm no good. It's the same with language. If we teach you know, the three R's, are so important. We don't teach them anymore in the West now because we think, well, kids from the poor background won't understand them, so we don't teach them. Then we're deliberately causing the language level to come down, and then we're, we're inadvertently grading them according to their home background without realizing it. So if we teach language skills, which of course is your domain, then we have to teach them the rules of how to spell a word. We have to use the rules of grammar, punctuation, syntax, and the rules of how to tell a story. Because when they're telling a story, they're sharing their mind with another person, whether it's an assignment, a homework, or an examination. But we don't teach them how to do that. It's specific rules. You know, the most important thing a parent can do is tell stories. You build up storytelling in children. I talk a lot with parents about this. Tell a story every night to tell until the 14th or 15th, or get them to tell you a story. Because when they're telling a story, they're creating the more words, the greater vocabulary, and they're using this information in a way so they can relate to different scenarios. So they have imagination, and they're ex the more, it's more interesting. So, you know, I went in a class and I said to these are 15 year olds, and I said, okay, I want you to write two lines of introduction, eight lines of text, and two lines of introduction. And when I went around, there was two girls who wrote the introduction. The rest didn't know how to write an introduction. They'd always been told, write an introduction, but they didn't understand what it meant. So we know we have this one-to-one -one inter interaction, which we can have formal 
if we develop the system of the, of the of the of the rows where the students talk to each other, and you know, and then you get this kind of a, an environment where the teacher can actually help every single student in a class at the same time. And this is important. I've actually got um, I'm actually writing a book now, uh, a new book called Tips for the Teaching. And uh, it's I'm on I've got 30 chapters. In. I just want to show you this picture because this shows you exactly what I mean. Okay. Um, okay. Um, oh, there we go. Okay. So this is what I'm talking about. We've got the students in two rows where they ask each other questions about what they didn't understand. You've just got to make sure that we're talking about the lesson, not about, you know, games or movies or anything like that. And use that system with people of all ages. And I do promise you, they will, everybody will enjoy it. And, um, one question. Um, yeah. There is a question from the audience in their cell. You talk about three three things, right? So possibly we didn't cover that one. Okay. Three hours. Okay. Traditionally, the three hours are reading, writing, and arithmetic. Uh, that's what's called the three hours: reading, writing, and arithmetic. And these are the these are the basic skills that so um, to write, to read, and to write. No, it's a, so. To, uh, to be able to read, you, you have to learn uh, phonics, you have to learn sounds and words, you, you have to learn how to read, you have to learn how to write, which of course is you know, learning the, you know, the verbs and the syntaxes and the prepositions and like that, and learning the arithmetic, which is numbers transposed, that's the three hours. Now, very interestingly, in the 1930s, there was a, an inspector in America called Benezet. And Benazir is working with a class of young children, and he realized that they were learning arithmetic just by memorizing, just by you know, two times two is three, three times three is nine. They were just memorizing. And he thought to himself, what would happen if I took mathematics out of the syllabus and instead I taught them how to reason and how to think? So he went into poor areas where the parents didn't know what was going on, and he took arithmetic out of the syllabus. And he put instead, um, you know, uh, a syllabus of reasoning skills, causing children to think about what they were doing. What he found out was that when those kids left the primary school and then went to the second or the higher school, in the first year, they had, they had done no mathematics before, but in the first year, they outperformed the kids who had done five years of mathematics because they learned how to think. Yeah, and so, you know, another thing to also talking about, you know, in the 1993, I think, 92, I think it was, they found what we call Mozart. If you listen to, them, to Mozart music, for some way, it changes the way, it changes the neurons to shift. And, that, and when, the, when the neurons shift in this way, having to listen to Mozart, it causes them to be better at um, spatial temporal reasoning, which is logic and mathematics. So for you and I, I mean, our brains are kind of fixed like that because they've grown that way. But if we listen to them, they will change. And then after that, they will go back. <laughs> but for pregnant mothers, for young children, if, the, if they play Mozart in the background, then the neural patterns of those children will automatically be situated that they'll be better at mathematics and chess and logical thinking. <coughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> so the three R's basically are the fundamentals by which we evaluate a competence and ability. These are how the child learns to think and how to use, and that all comes down to the rules that I explained to you before, which are the two languages, which represent the two languages. Mm. Right, Tina. Sir, I think uh, we can end 
because we don't have any particular questions on this topic anymore because uh, Roy has covered almost all the areas and uh, we also have actually uh, collected those questions from the audiences. So I think uh, you can end if uh, Roy and you well, just, agree. Just, just one question. A, a lady asked a question about how to inspire students. This is really um, so what I, what I do is that Yes, how to inspire students. Okay. Do, do you remember I told you that when I went back to school at 20, I had a purpose. I wanted to sail around the world. And, and my purpose, that inspired me to want to work because I did it for myself. The problem for students in school is they are forced to go into the room, they're forced to sit there, and they're forced to listen to the teacher for 45 minutes. There's no drive within them. They're not doing it because they want to do it. So what I say to my older students is, look, I want you to think about what you would be happy to do for the rest of your life. When you leave school, what area would you be happy to live in? Do you want to be a, you know, do you want to design clothes? Do you want to make, do you want to work with engines? Do you want to be an artist? Uh, do, you, you know, do you want to work with animals? Do you like to work with old people? Do you like to work with children? What area do you feel that you would be happy with? And once they say, well, so I would like this idea, then you find a job. And you say, great, if you get this job, you'll get this amount of money, then you can buy a motorbike, whatever it is. And so then you get a piece of paper. And here, they, they say, this is my job, and I want to be an astronaut. It doesn't matter what it is. And then here I am now. They, they, they have a photograph of who they are, and they plan a strategy. I get these grades, I go to this college, I get to this university, I get this work experience, I get here, I get more work experience, I get this job. And every example, they can just color it in, they can build it up, kind of like a visualization board. And I've got these big boards in the classroom where they have their purpose. So they're coming to school because they want to be a clothes designer, they want to be a language teacher, or they want to be a student. It doesn't matter. And they can change it. That's not the point. The point is they're coming to school for their dream. And that's what we need to do. And it works the same with university students. You know, you know, students come to university either because they have a purpose or because they're being pushed into it by the father or by some friends or by somebody. Oh, that looks fun. But once they get into it, then it's so boring. They've got to do exams. There is interest and they drop out. This inspiration is fundamental. <laughs> Thank you, Roy, for answering the question. Thank you for having me. I was delighted to meet you all. And I hope that when this pandemic's over, I may have the opportunity to come meet you physically. That would be great. Okay, Roy, we are like almost we, we are there. We have almost covered two hours. The start at six now, almost two hours. Okay. So um, from uh, the Tissot Society of Bangladesh, I, re I am really glad that we got Roy Anderson both. I wish we can go through his uh, impressive list of books that I saw in the LinkedIn. I don't well, know how to get a copy of all these books. Well, if it you, is, yeah. you, you, you can get them from, okay, I mean, you can get them off Amazon, but you can write Amazon. to me. Yeah, you can write. But basically, you know, the illusion of education explains why yes. do you not teach children how to think in school? Why we, why we make kids dumb? Where is it going? And the dangers of artificial intelligence within the school's complex. The hidden exactly. secret of intelligence proves why intelligence is not genetically inherited. If we don't inherit intelligence, what do we inherit? And the brain environment complex gives a new concept of what intelligence is and how we can help to learn better. But it basically comes down to love. That's all it is. Patience, tolerance, compassion, empathy, understanding how to give security to the distracted mind. That's all it is. We need a new kind of world, uh, preparing a world for education. We need, you know, the subjects we have, the, the, the syllabus is now, they're 100 years out of date. We need to have, we have people to show the new skills. And like my friend said before, social skills, empathetic skills, moral skills. Preparing new world education. You know, it took 10 years, it just took three months, and it's the best one. It's a hands on experience about teacher and me. Helping kids, helping parents, and helping kids make a better education system. And, and uh, oh, just uh, if I can just. Uh, okay.
So, it's okay. I'm sure, uh, if given a chance, all these books are very useful for our practitioners and educators. And I understand, Roy, the, uh, a single session is not sufficient for this kind of discussion. We hope to arrange more um, as a discussion session with you so that um, some of the issues that you talked about, some of the concern that are raised by you, uh, similar concern that we share as a parents and teachers in the schools. So um, I guess we'll try to get back to you with some more sessions so that uh, we can have lively discussion on other uh, and answer issues that we couldn't cover today. Thank so, you so much. Thank you. And Roy, with your um, approval, uh, let me thank all the organizers, especially Afrojak Tina, Lisa Sharmi from Jaffa International University for helping the association to organize such a beautiful program. And the people, the, the most powerful part is the volunteers, I think, Mr. Atiku Rahman and Akibu Rahman, who help us with the technical support and hosting this team year session. And all my uh, volunteer members of the association were still working and still sharing the live session. Right, just to let you know that all session have already shared on your LinkedIn and your Facebook account everywhere it is live. And I already shared the link. You'll be able to share with your um, colleagues uh, in Lahore and all over the world. Thank you so much. I think with that note, I want to end the session. Anything else, Lisa, you want to say anything? Any closing remarks? Lisa Sharmin, with, can you unmute your microphone, please? Full session. Uh, I enjoyed every bit of it, and I have uh, so many questions actually, and I have quenched my thirst. Thank you, Anderson. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Okay. Thank you. Okay, I think we can close it now. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tina. Thank you, Liz, and thank you, Shimmer. Thank you. Very much. God bless you. Thank you.